Welcome, everybody, to this latest edition of Testable Faith. My name is Fuzz Rana. I am a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe, which is the organization that sponsors this program. Uh, today, we're going to take on the question, what are the boundaries of science? And I'm joined in studio today by Dr. Eric Hedin, who is a physicist. He was a professor at Ball State University, also a professor at Biola University, teaching physics in both places, and also is the author of a book called Canceled Science. And again, we're going to take on this question, what are the boundaries of science? So, Eric, thanks for being here with us. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're going to talk about the boundaries of science, probably the first question, and though it's a bit of an unfair question, uh, and that is, what is science, right? You know, philosophers of science have debated for probably decades what is the, the proper definition of science, and nobody's able to produce that. But so I'm going to ask you, as a physicist, how do you define science? That, that is an important foundational question. I would say that science is simply the investigation of how nature really works. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than presupposing uh, certain ways that things must happen, just uh, doing the uh, honest investigation to see, and sometimes surprising answers come forth as we investigate and find out really the way things work. Yeah, and it's really a, a disciplined approach to understanding how things work in nature, right? Yes, there's there's a, a certain process that uh, kind of known as the scientific method and generally um, looking for natural explanations for phenomenon and making maybe a, a hypothesis and then uh, actually doing testing through observations, experiments, and so on. And sometimes that confirms or uh, maybe overthrows your hypothesis. So it's back to the drawing board at that point. Right, right. Now, it, today, uh, with contemporary science, there's a particular framework that is used to, to guide that process of invest, investigating nature mm -hmm. called methodological naturalism. Maybe unpack that a little bit for us and talk may, uh, about uh, what are the maybe the benefits of that approach and maybe what are the limitations? Well, I think that it, it has some value in that in general, science would like to come up with a naturalistic explanation for some phenomenon, you know, whether it's trying to understand how a solar system forms or, or something in geology for planet Earth, um, even in electronics. But the, the kind of presupposition that can be added on to methodological naturalism is that only naturalistic explanations are fair game for bringing to the scientific table. And uh, as far as you know, where that might, uh, I think, run afoul of the boundaries of science is that I don't know that uh, it's, it's even a good idea to impose that sort of a, a viewpoint on the investigation of nature because we actually don't know from a starting point whether or not there are phenomena in nature that uh, mm -hmm. maybe need another type of an explanation besides a naturalistic explanation. Things like the origin of, of life or the mm -hmm. conscious mind, um, the universe itself. Okay, so, you know, oftentimes you hear this expression, well, you can't put God in a test tube, right? So, you know, because it seems to me like you're saying that maybe some explanations for features in nature might require us to go beyond mechanism alone. Mm -hmm. So how would you respond to that, that common objection to, to the position that you're, you're seemingly espousing? I think it's valid to say you can't put God in a test tube, meaning uh, if we think of God as a, a being, he has a volition and free will, and, and it's not going to be uh, just sort of structured by hard and fast laws, like the laws of gravity and so on that we know in, in nature. Um, so we can't test God in that sense. But what we can do is look at what we know about nature and then ask if mm -hmm. this phenomenon that we're investigating is consistent 
with the laws of nature? And if so, then okay, yeah. that's probably the way it works. But um, I believe that it is possible to look at certain phenomenon that exist in our universe, again, such as, as life, such as um, even the origin of uh, the universe and specific laws and so on. And we can see that there is perhaps a greater consistency with something beyond nature. Mm -hmm. um, so we aren't testing God, but we may be ascribing to God something that seems naturally implausible. Right. And to the degree that um, you know, just describing it to luck is perhaps not a, right. a very uh, scientific <laughs> outcome or conclusion either. Now, now, somebody might say, well, you're, maybe you're advancing kind of a God of the gaps approach where, mm -hmm. look, natural process mechanisms can't account for a particular feature in, in, you know, in the universe or a particular phenomenon in the universe. You know, and so, therefore, it must be a creator there must be something outside yes. the universe. Uh, so how how is your approach in, uh, immune to that that criticism, if okay. it is immune to that criticism? Right, and I, I am very sensitive to that criticism. It it would be the last thing I would want to be mm -hmm. uh, kind of guilty of of doing, um, because I I don't think that it is in line with good science to. Uh, approach some phenomenon in nature and say, well, we don't know how that works, so, um, you know, it just must be something God did. Um, rather, what I would like to uh, suggest is that we can, from a position of knowledge, from our actual understanding through observation, testing, the scientific method, what we know about nature, we can ask if, again, certain phenomena are consistent with what we know nature can do. And if so, then it's probably natural. But if not, then logic suggests if it can't be done naturally, but here it is, then yeah. it must be something beyond nature. So I don't think that's saying, oh, if we just learned more. Right. No, we already know enough. What we know is right. telling us that it can't be natural. It's not what we don't know. Right. So if there's two options and in, in you, in effect, rule out one option for all intents and purposes, then you are only really left with the other option, is, is your argument. Yes, there's kind of a logic yeah. to the process. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, it's interesting to me that there are actually scientific disciplines that, you know, have the capacity to detect directly the work of intelligent agency, right, with respect to features in nature. Uh, mm. You know, one example would be SETI, yes. right? So, they, you know, the claim is, well, here's electromagnetic radiation emanating from a distant source, and we can tell from the features of that radiation whether it originated through some kind of natural process phenomena, even if it's an unknown natural process, or mm -hmm. if it was some type of alien civilization, even yeah. though we may not know anything about that alien civilization. Yes, exactly, and that, that is a, uh, a great example. Uh, SETI is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, even from my own discipline, I used to teach a lot of astronomy courses, and we would um, bring this up because it was in the textbooks uh, about the discovery of pulsars, the very first discovery of these uh, collapsed, what are now known as collapsed uh, stars, known as neutron stars. And um, turns out that they produce a signal which, when it was first discovered in the mid-1960s, by accident, someone using a primitive radio telescope, it was it was unlike any other signal coming from space that had ever been picked up, and and uh, so apparently the discoverers initially kind of put a little question mark in their lab notebook, like uh, ET or you know LGM, Little Green Man, something like that, and um, but you could rule it out because right. the type of signal wasn't consistent with an intelligent source. It, right. it, it was uh, very sharp and uh, rapid, but it uh, never varied. Right. And uh, any sort of an intelligent message, you know, if it's Morse code, there's, there's quite a variation in the, mm -hmm. the signal. So we can, in fact, use what we know of the difference between natural and intelligent messages to sort out what their source might be. So it's not just merely logic then, but we could even go one step further using strictly scientific methodology mm -hmm. and at least make the case that not only 
can we not account for this phenomena through natural processes, but that there may even be signatures in those processes or in that phenomena that suggest intelligent agency? Exactly right. Um, you know, the whole field of um, cryptography or, or trying to break a code right. um, or, or write a code that can't be broken. Um, you know, how do you if, you, if you pick up a message, let's say during wartime from an enemy and it, you know, how do you know it's a, a code that has some meaningful information that might be worthwhile trying mm -hmm. to figure out um, versus just some random noise radio signal? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the researchers in that field have algorithms, in fact, mm -hmm. that they can apply to even an unknown code to determine if it's just junk or if it's mm -hmm. actually containing a meaningful message. Yeah. All right, so maybe give me a few examples where you think uh, that the science indicates that certain features of our universe or maybe even our universe itself just go beyond what natural process mechanisms can account for? Well, I, uh, I already mentioned just briefly the idea of um, the origin of the universe, which is, is fairly well known uh, that uh, science now ascribes it to uh, an, a singularity, an event known as the Big Bang. And um, what's meaningful about that for this discussion is that the beginning of the universe is also through our application of the general theory of relativity, we know it is also the beginning of space and of time and of matter and of energy. And so any cause for the origin of the universe has to be somehow beyond or transcendent to mm -hmm. matter and energy. It has to be transcendent to time and, and space. And so really can't say that the universe created itself. It, it uh, wasn't just an explosion uh, within the universe, but something uh, completely beyond. And of course, uh, that doesn't absolutely prove that it is the God of the Bible, but it is at least consistent mm -hmm. with what we understand of what Genesis says of how God uh, spoke and the universe came into existence. Maybe a couple other examples. Well, along with that, just following further, the universe and its uh, origin is not just chaotic, but it, from our study of the laws of nature, has shown itself to be remarkably finely tuned mm -hmm. to allow for life eventually to exist in this universe. Um, and then coming forward in time to the origin of life, I would say that that is an event in the universe that is uh, completely unnatural. Uh, I've said this before in a talk that uh, life is probably the most unnatural thing in the universe mm -hmm. in the sense not, you know, you know, this is a natural product versus an unnatural product, but that life, living organisms and their origin are inconsistent with what we know of the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. Nature doesn't tend to produce complex functional systems. It tends to randomize Mm -hmm. material to where it's really not that interesting anymore. Right. Or if it does generate ordered systems, they're very simplistic systems. Right, right. and you use the word ordered, and, and that's key because nature is good at making ordered systems, crystalline structures and so on, snowflakes even, ordered systems. Um, but, and there are other examples, but life is not ordered. Uh, it's uh, it's complex. It's not repetitious like that, that pulsar signal. Um, there's a, uh, a spe specificity mm -hmm. and a complexity, and it does something. It's not just uh, random. Yeah. Okay, so maybe last question. What is the, the, maybe the ultimate danger, if, and I'm putting that in quote marks, sure. you know, of, of, of operating in a scientific framework where we don't allow investigation of phenomena that go beyond the, 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 the limitations or the boundaries established by you know, methodological naturalism. I think that the ultimate danger of kind of imposing those blinders um, in a way, you know, you could only look here but not outside of these parameters, um, is missing 
the main point, missing the boat. Um, you know, any time you limit, self-limit um, explanations, you may be missing an explanation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when it comes to this particular topic, the missed explanation uh, that we're discussing would be evidence for God as the creator of the universe. Right. And, and, of course, that is uh, significant in, in so many ways to our lives. Yeah. That's definitely something we don't want to miss, right? E exactly right. The, uh, the implications um, go far beyond just uh, what might be important within the scientific realm, but for giving meaning to our lives. And I think all of us want to have a feeling that we're more than just a, a random uh, blip uh, of nature, mm -hmm. but uh, that our lives have purpose and meaning. And uh, I believe, honestly, that a, a true look at nature and the boundaries of science points us towards that meaning through the existence of God. Eric, thank you. This has been a fascinating conversation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us for this episode of Testable Faith. If you want to know more about Eric Hadeen and experience more of the resources that he's created for us at Reasons to Believe, search his name, last name is Hadeen, H-E-D-I-N, uh, at our website, reasons.org. And then also, I would invite you to check out his book, uh, Canceled Science, which you can get through Amazon or any of these other book distributors. Until next time, remember, the more we know about science, the more we have reasons to believe.